Good evening. Uh, I'm Dan Doctoroff for another four weeks, the CEO of Bloomberg. Um, and I am thrilled to welcome you all to the Council on Foreign Relations meeting. This is Growth, Innovation, and Technology, a conversation with Michael Dell. Um, I want to thank Bernard Schwartz uh, for his generosity in establishing this lecture in 2002. Uh, these are typically some of the most interesting meetings that the Council hosts, and we are thrilled to have you with us this evening. Just a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, please turn off, not just put on vibrate your electronic devices to avoid interference with the sound system or interruptions to our discussion. If you'd like to use an electronic device today, please do so outside the room. Uh, and I would like to remind the members that this meeting is on the record and live streamed and recorded. That out of the way, I just want to say something quickly. Um, a few months ago, my friends at uh, the council asked me to moderate an evening discussion with a very special guest. I said, well, who is it? And they said, we're not going to tell you. <laughs> I said, well, give me some hints. They told me it was a guy by the name of Mike, <laughs> a guy who founded his company 30 years ago <laughs> out of a single room, a guy who grew his company from its humble beginnings to become one of the most successful and influential technology companies in the world. A guy who became a billionaire and launched one of the largest and most important philanthropic organizations in the company. A guy who stepped down as CEO of the company that bears his name after a 20-year tenure <laughs> only to return to the helm <laughs> I can understand why CFR tapped me for this role. This one actually hits pretty close to home. And by the way, <laughs> Michael, I do have my resume in, in, my, in my pocket here. Nonetheless, it truly is an honor to share this. And I understand you have experience working with Michael, so that's uh, uh, no question about it. So now it is my uh, real pleasure to share the stage with Michael Dell, an entrepreneur so legendary that his name has been synonymous with innovation for three decades. Undoubtedly, you know the story of Michael growing the company that bears his name in, from nothing um, into the world's largest PC maker. And you know uh, that in recent years, he's not only returned to the helm, uh, but taking the reins, reins at a time of unprecedented upheaval in the PC and technology space, he's taken his company private, and now is pivoting Dell's products, services, and culture with incredible speed that betrays its massive 100,000 person workforce. Here, though, are a few facts that you may not know. When Michael was nine, he applied for his GED. Did you actually pass it? No. No. Okay. no. Well, I, I, I ne never got a chance to take it. So. Oh, okay. Uh, when he was 12, he got a job washing dishes in a Chinese food restaurant. When he was a teenager, he set an all-time record by selling $18,000 worth of Houston Post newspaper subscriptions in a single year, a record that may well stand for all time. <laughs> since nobody's selling digital subscriptions anymore. The next time you run into a kid, seriously, who thinks that he or she can take shortcuts or can just start or blog or write an app and get rich, tell them to read up on Michael Dell. He's the definition of work ethic, his unique combination of visionary thinking and determined effort makes him a role model to all of us who are looking to be successful in business and maybe even leave the world a little better off. So Michael, let's get started. Thank you for that very kind introduction. You're welcome. So let me ask you a question. What motivates you? What drives you? It's been that way since you were a little kid. What is it that has made you sort of the kind of driven entrepreneur that you are? 
You know, I think it's just been been curiosity. I, I like to I like to win. You know, I I, I like to do be, be involved in interesting things. I mean, uh, I've I've uh, always been fascinated with with business, um, and um, you know, uh, calculating machines uh, intrigued me from a, from a very early age. My dad had this uh, adding machine, and you know, it was the kind where you'd, you'd press the numbers and it would make a lot of noise, and, and it was kind of fascinating to me that, that, that this thing was, was adding up numbers. And then uh, in the early 70s, the, the first semiconductor-based calculators came out. And I was you know, like seven years old, and it was pretty interesting to me to kind of say, this thing could do math problems. And then, you know, I was reading about the microprocessor, and then you know, at it, seven it, years old. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, you know a little later. Yeah. You know, 11, 11 12. <laughs> and, late, late uh, rumor, and and uh, you know, it was kind of the beginning of the microprocessor age, and um, you know, it, it was just just incredibly interesting to me that, that, that you know the idea that uh, now you could have a a computer yourself, right? Uh, I was, in a, I was in a math class in my junior high school, and I got lucky. In my math class, there was a teletype terminal, hmm. and you could program, you know, uh, you know, and send the program off to the mainframe. The answer would come back, and that was just really interesting to me. So I, you know, dove into that, understood as much as I could about that. And then, you know, right, right, that was right about the time the microprocessor-based computers were, were, were coming out. And, and so... You know, it's just been a big, fun adventure, and it continues. Certainly continues. So a year ago, you took uh, the company private uh, with Silver Lake. Um, you, before the acquisition, were the CEO. You owned about 15% of the company. Today, you own about 70% of the company. Why do this? You know, you're worth billions of dollars. Why double down? Why not? I mean, uh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, what else are you going to do? I mean, uh, so so I mean, uh, I'm very familiar with guys who <laughs> didn't know what else to do. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in in uh, in 2007, uh, we set the business on a pretty new course, and we said we need to build. Uh, capability in solutions and services and software. We started acquiring other companies and really moving the business in a different direction while still you know, holding on to the kind of core infrastructure product business that we had, but helping our customers solve the bigger problem that, that, that they were having. So as we set about to do that, we, we acquired you know, 40 companies, and those 40 companies have themselves acquired 150 companies. As we were doing that, you know, the, the financial markets uh, you know, were, were not really enjoying what we were doing, right? right. And, and so there, there, there was a lot of uh, uh, kind of competing pressures in terms of, okay, you know, don't do that, you know, have a bigger dividend, do a, do a share repurchase, you know, why don't you, you know, consider other, other alternatives? So you saw this pressure between the kind of short-term minded investor and the long-term minded investor. And so I felt the best option for the company to be able to invest more in R&D and get on a, a growth path once again and continue the, the strategy that we're on because we fundamentally haven't changed the, the strategy since we've gone private. We've just accelerated it. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a long, drawn-out process. We got through all that. And was there ever a time when you really thought you weren't going to succeed during that whole long, drawn-out process? There were some pretty dark moments. It, it was, a, it was a, a pretty harrowing uh, uh, process. And, you know, when, whenever you go through something like that, you're effectively putting the company in play. And you know uh, the, the company was available for sale, right? And it's the only way you can do it. And and, yeah. and uh, uh, there were lots of other buyers that showed up. And and uh, uh, you know, fortunately, we 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 
we got through that and, and uh, you know, ended up uh, being the high bidder and paying, paying the highest price available to, to shareholders. Um, but, you know, it, it inflicted, you know, uh, uncertainty, you know, for a time uh, on our team and customers. Fortunately, um, you know, our, our team really responded well to that. They, they held together extremely well. And when it was all done, boy, were they excited, right? You know, the, the, the energy and passion among, among the workforce has really been a, a uh, uh, much greater than, 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 than I expected su positive surprise. Why, why do you think that's happened? Well, let's, let's step back for one sec. I mean, based on reports, including Bloomberg News, which is never wrong, the value of the company, the value of your stake has increased substantially. You've paid down about $3 billion of debt. Um, and while we don't know what earnings are, um, the uh, clearly revenues are up. I mean, after a year, it looks great. So what, j just tell us how you feel after one year. I um, feel absolutely great. I mean, you know, look, uh, you know, what, <laughs> uh, you know, I think uh, even more convinced that it was the right thing to do. Uh, you know, we've been able to direct our energy 100% towards our customers. And what our team has seen is that there's real conviction in the investments in the business. And so, you know, whether you've been at the company for a day or for a quarter of a century, you see the, the, you know, the company really investing seriously behind the big areas where we want to grow versus what's going on competitively with split ups and spin outs and, and right. all, all sorts of things. And it's working, right? We're gaining share, we're, we're, we're growing. And, and so uh, that's a lot more fun than what we were doing before. Now, now, you were the CEO before. The employees were the same employees. Um, what's happened is you're not public anymore. Is it being not public that makes that big a difference in terms of how excited the employees are, kind of how well you're actually doing? Is it really that big a difference? You know, let me go back to this 2007 time frame. And if you study the company, what you'll notice is that we went through a pretty big change in terms of what we were right. endeavoring to achieve. And we were, you know, acquiring all kinds of new businesses, new, new activities. There was a negative feedback loop, right? So we would go do those things and then the market would kind of say, no, we don't want you to do that. Stock would go down. That wears on people. It's, 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 pretty, it's pretty difficult. And, uh, uh, you know, now they see this, this basically permanent capital owning, owning right. the company and focused on the long term, and it's working. You know, we, 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 had, we had an event after everything was all done inside the company, and it was, it was one of the most memorable events ever, ever in the company. And, you know, we were playing loud rock and roll music, I mean, we had chains unleashed. I mean, it, it, was, it, it was webcast all over the, the world, you know, in every country where Dell operates, and teams were cheering and excited. And when you get that kind of passion unleashed with 100,000 people, and then you follow it up with investments and progress, uh, that, that kind of force is, is really uh, uh, fantastic. And so that's, that's, that's the momentum that we've had. We just had... Uh, Dell World a few weeks ago in, in Austin, we had uh, 5,000 customers. We had hundreds of customers coming and explaining how they're using our technology and our solutions to enable their businesses. And, you know, essentially directed all the energy of the company to how do we help our customers be successful. And yeah, I've read a lot about the customers and the comments that they've had about just in a year the company being so much more responsive to your customers. And it really is sort of that taking the public focus off, rechanneling that energy that's really produced that kind of creativity, entrepreneurship, and drive, despite the fact it's the same, basically the same employees and the same CEO. It's pretty interesting, pretty interesting tale.
you know, what we heard from, from customers at, at Dell World was that you know, the, the level of innovation that they've seen from the company in, in, in the last year is, is pretty remarkable. And one of the challenges for us is we've created so many new things, even we don't know about them, right? You know, you know our, all, all the people in the company don't know about them, and certainly our 10 million right. plus customers don't all know about them yet. That's one of our challenges is how do we get out and explain all the new capabilities we have in cybersecurity, in you know, solutions, and in you know, uh, helping our customers you know, deal with the cloud, deal with mobile technologies. The, um, speaking of long term, you, know, you have a partner, owns 25%, private equity firms, I used to run one, are generally not known for their really long term horizon. You know, typically they have, a, uh, they have a fund and they want to liquefy in some form within um, five years maybe. How do you think about that as a window or do you have an understanding with Silver Lake that you're going to do whatever it is for the long term and they're going to have to trust you and they're going to be around along for the ride? Well, look, you know, we'll, we'll figure that out. You know, they, they're, they're not permanent capital. They do have a fund. Uh, and there are any number of ways to, to, you know, to deal with that. So, you know, at the right time. The, um, you know, you, we talked about going private. Give me a couple of really good examples of how your decision making has actually changed in the last year as a result of the fact that you don't have to deal with that, you know, 90 seconds shot clock, that quarterly reporting that you did before. Yeah, the, the 90 day shot clock. So 90 day shot clock, right. Uh, you know, the first thing that you realize is that in a, in a large public company, you have a machine that is essentially constructed to, uh, you know, uh, you know all, all, all the leaders in the company are thinking about, okay, how do we deliver the results that we're supposed to be delivering, right? And, and anything that is sort of outside of that you know, there's a lot of energy to not go do those things, right? right? And so first you have to kind of retrain people to, to say, well, hey, you know, what are the new opportunities? Um, because we, we weren't necessarily seeing them all. And so you want to take on some new risks. You want to, you want to accept some, some volatility. And so as we go around and look at the business, we're finding areas where we can, you know, substantially grow parts of the business that are, uh, you know, that, 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 have, that have tremendous potential. And, you know, so we're, you know, laying, laying down new investments. Uh, you know, we had a review of our software business on, on Monday. And the team came back with, we have a particular business that's growing very, very rapidly. And, you know, we kind of challenged the team at the prior review to come back with a plan to make that like four times bigger than it is now. And we think that's very possible. We think we know how to do that. Uh, the sort of gap financial results, you know, to, to, to go make that happen are not particularly great, but not that's, really. that's going to be a fantastic business, right? So we're, we're going to go do that, right? And, and uh, uh, you know, as, as, you, as you discuss, uh, you know, the, the business with, with your colleagues, it's like, okay, yeah, the, you know this this particular period, uh, it's a it's a nanosecond in the you know life of a company. How do we take the business we have today and grow it substantially faster than the industry for five years, for ten years? And what do we need to go make that happen? So you start to turn on a whole different part of the brain for our our team. Let's talk for a second about the PC business. You know, in the last year, your market share in the PC business has gone from 11.9%, I think, to 13.3%. The PC business has turned out to be, at least the market itself, beyond your market share gains, better than you thought at the time of the acquisition. What's going on in that business right now? Help us understand some of those underlying dynamics. Well, this is not really new information, but there, there are about 1.8 billion PCs in the world, roughly 380 million sold per year, and about 35% of them are four years old or older. This is actually very similar to the data 
you know, even a year and a half or two years ago. Right. And so what you have is a business where at various points in the cycle, new things will come along where the customer will say, hey, this product is so much better than the, the, the one they have, it's five years old, right? Right. <laughs> that I should replace it. Now, if we don't create a new product that's significantly better than the one we sold you in 2007, shame on us, right? You, know, you, you, know, you shouldn't buy one. But if, if, we, if we do, then you know, we get this massive wave of, of replacement. And certainly there are other factors, you know, Microsoft having a, a new release of the operating system or expiring the, the support for an older version. We see that in the data center too. You know, there's a Windows Server 2003, millions of servers are going to, going to be replaced. Yeah. And we've got a whole new product cycle geared up for that. Um, and look, I, I, think, I think with the excitement and energy around smartphones and tablets, at one point there was this idea that somehow those were all going to replace the PC. And the, the reality inside businesses is, is a little bit different. Right? You, you actually have more than one device and you know, each device doesn't necessarily replace the other device. So if I have a smartphone, I don't necessarily uh, not have a PC. Maybe I have, have both <laughs> and you know, the, the tablet, that may be a third device. You know, we have these convertible two-in-one devices that sort of combine the, the notebook and, and the tablet. And then of course you've got the emerging markets, right? You know, enormous growth outside the United States and, and uh, you know, billions of new users coming online. And then the other interesting thing is, is uh, our business is, is, is way beyond the PC. Right? For every 50 or 60 new smartphones that get minted out there in the world, there's a new server that pops up to feed the right. data. Right. And as the world digitizes and as the cost of silicon comes down, you have this explosion in the amount of data. It all has to be stored, protected, analyzed, turned into valuable insights. So the pie of opportunities for us is, is just growing. And then you have the, you know, the Internet of Things, which are kind of like little PCs that are embedded in lots of uh, you know, uh, you know, devices out there. So we've got an expanding uh, uh, space that requires investment, requires, you know, uh, uh, conviction. Beyond the PC, as you mentioned, you're into all sorts of things. You kind of want to be the end-to-end -end provider. So you're in cloud storage, you are in data analytics, you're in security, you're in mobile, kind of the list goes on and on. Of all of those non-PC products, which is the one that you are most excited about today? Well, there's, 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 it's like, uh, you know, All which your of your children do you, do you like the most? You know, uh, we, we and I'm <laughs> asking you to pick. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty hard to do. I mean, Let me ask the question a different way. If you were a, um, you were 20 something, you're 18 years old again, um, being the entrepreneur that you are, What's the company, what kind of company, and what area would you want to create today? Where would you want to focus? The big opportunity that I see is in turning the data into useful insights and, and outcomes. And so it's what we call the data economy. And you think about how, you know, how's the tech sector going to grow from $3 trillion to $4 trillion? I'm convinced it's this data economy. And the way to think about it is we've been helping customers store, protect, this data for a really long time, how many of them actually use the data to make better decisions, particularly in real time? The real answer is almost none, right? And so that unleashes an enormous amount of productive power in the economy. That's a huge opportunity, and that requires all kinds of new, new capabilities. The, um, just wanna make sure we're not going too long, so I wanna give the audience time any big mistakes you've made over the last year? Anything you actually regret over the last year? Yeah, it's been a really good year. I, 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 don't, I, 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 don't, I don't have a lot of How complaints. How many of you can say that? You know, I think, I, I, I think we've, we've uh, 
we've, you know, we've, we've been running pretty fast and doing some things and, and, and we're learning things. So for example, you know, we've been uh, adding lots of channel partners into our business. We've been working more with systems integrators. We're covering, you know, uh, working to cover a lot more customers. As we've done that, we've, we've you know, done some things with our, our, our 20,000 uh, person sales force to try to line them up you know, against the right opportunities. Sometimes we've changed things a little too fast and that's disrupted the business. So we you know, learn from that and, and, and change. You know, I think it's, it's how fast do you learn and how fast do you, do you take the learning? Uh, but you know, so far, uh, no, no real big, big mistakes. And you know, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of, of experiments and, and uh, funding a lot of, of uh, new things that uh, we're, we're, we're quite encouraged by. I mean, we have a fantastic business in healthcare IT where we are creating the health information systems, the evidence-based medicine systems, you know, the uh, you know, physician affiliated you know, systems, uh, and you know, healthcare IT is, a, is an enormously uh, rapidly growing sector. What, well, well positioned there. That's a place where we're you know, investing. One thing our companies share obviously as we mentioned before um, both have founders who have their names on the door um, when i announced i was leaving i was quoted in the new york times as saying mike is like god at bloomberg you know he created the universe he issued the ten commandments in our case then he disappeared um, and came back but <laughs> you know <laughs> the thing is, is that when you have god um, at the company people are going to listen and frequently um, they are going to be either afraid or intimidated to really push back. How do you encourage people to actually push back on you? Well, I think you have to first of all look look to make sure that that uh, you know that that uh, they're not telling you what you want to hear, and that's relatively easy to 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 understand. Um, uh, but you know, ha having an open culture, uh, having a uh, you know a, a strong team. It's it's not just me. I mean, uh, you know, we, we we have we have an enormously talented group of people, and and uh, you know, I'm I'm fortunate to, to, to lead the company now. But you know, uh, you you don't get to do everything forever. Um, if you own seventy percent, you can if you want. To. <laughs> but you still can't do it forever. I mean, you know, <laughs> you, know, um, um, you know, I think I think we've 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 done a a, a nice job in in our culture of of, uh, of you know having uh, active debate and discussion and and uh, discourse uh, you know around you know ideas and and. Um, you know, it, 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 it's absolutely important. The um, beyond your um, role uh, at Dell, um, you've also been a ter tremendous philanthropist. Um, what are the things that you really would l really like to focus on with your philanthropy going forward? Yeah, you know, we've we've focused on areas where we can. Uh, work for a few years and then leave, right? <laughs> and 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 have some and have some change occur, um, and uh, primarily focused on children in urban poverty. Uh, one of the areas where I think the foundation has done some incredible work is on you know, measurement and data, in particularly in the uh, public school system. Uh, there was a a formative project in, in, the, in New York City that, that the foundation was very involved in. And out of that and a number of other things, uh, we created this standard called EDFI, which is now adopted in, I think, about 35 of the, of the 50 states uh, and being used as a way. He, he, here's the problem. Child goes from the third grade to the fourth grade. What does the fourth grade teacher know about how the child did on particular subjects, 
Did they have an attendance problem? Uh, you know, what, you know, what do you actually know about this kid? Um, at a small private school, maybe the teachers will talk to each other. They'll explain, you know, th this is what you need to know about this kid to help the kid succeed. Uh, the other challenge you have is you'll have two classrooms in the same school. Kids go in and they come out, but different outcomes. And who's doing anything about it, right? We're, 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 uh, uh, you know, what's, what's the, what's the uh, opportunity to, to, to expose that data to the principal, to the, uh, to the parents, right? And, and you know, make some real productive uh, change in the system. So one last question before we turn it over to the audience. Actually, you said that our foreign policy has been focused on, quote, dropping bombs instead of dropping jobs, and that you're pushing to include job growth uh, as part of the UN sustainable, UN sustainable Development Goals. How do you think developed countries can best help developing countries create good jobs? Well, I, I, I took on this, this uh, other job with the United Nations as the global advocate for entrepreneurship. And one, one of my observations traveling around the world is, uh, you know, there, there, are, there are places where there are lots of young people that are very excited about their future. And uh, they're often very near some of these conflict zones. I mean, we, we have in Dell the, the example of Morocco, okay? And I remember this because we were looking at setting up a site in Northern Africa, and we were comparing Morocco and Tunisia. And it was about 60-40, you know, in favor of Morocco. Now, the, the Tunisian government could have done a few things here and there, and maybe, maybe it would have been, you know, in favor of Tunisia. But Morocco won. And if you go to our site in Morocco, we've got like 2,000 people there. They're young, excited, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. You know, the unemployment rate in Morocco is not very high. And those young people go home to their families and they, you know, believe that their future is going to be better, you know, tomorrow and, and they're, 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 they're excited. Uh, if you go to some of these conflict zones, you know, you can change the government, you can have whatever, you know, military action uh, occurs. If you still have an enormous number of young people that are unemployed, you get a real problem. And, and so I think, I think the, the, you know, you think about where do the next 500 million jobs come from? Where do the next billion jobs come from? 70 to 90% of the new jobs anyway come from entrepreneurs, small, medium-sized businesses. And so we ought to be thinking really seriously about how do we create jobs and opportunity in those countries because no matter what you do, uh, at the end of the day, if there aren't jobs, you're, you're going you're gonna to have a, a continuing problem and, and, and maybe a worsening problem. Great. Thanks. So at this time, I want to invite uh, members of our audience to join the conversation with their questions. Um, and a reminder that uh, this meeting is uh, on the record. Uh, wait for the microphone and speak directly into it. Please stand and state your name and affiliation. And please limit yourself to one question and keep it concise to allow as many members as possible um, to speak. So, right here. Thank you so much. My name is Lara Satrakian. I'm with News Deeply. I'm a new media entrepreneur. And I'd love to get your take on risk taking and resilience. You touched on some of it, but how do you really take risks? How do you make the choice to go for it? And when you have those dark moments, how do you, frankly, accelerate the time it takes to bounce back? Yeah, well, I, you know, risk taking for me is, is pretty natural. Um, but I'm I'm not I, I'm not like a gambler, and I don't jump out of airplanes, you know. So I, I, my 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 risks are pretty calculated. <laughs> um, but um, you know, I think big companies are not good at taking risks. And, and the bigger they get, the the you know, even the word risk, you like can't find it in big companies. <laughs> it, you know, it, you know, it 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 sort of gets 
taken out of the building. So my job is to make sure it stays there and we talk about it. We talk about taking risks, which basically means you got to accept some failure. And, um, you know, uh, you know, way to think about it, uh, you know, inside an organization is, uh, I don't want you to do five things and get all five right. I want you to do 10 things and if you get seven or eight of them right, that's okay. And you actively communicate that. Yeah, now if you keep making the same mistake over and over again, that's not risk taking, right? <laughs> so so <laughs> be clear that's, about that. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yes, right here. Thank you very much, Mahesh Kotecha. I'm, uh, it's a thrill to uh, speak to the guy who created the machines I use all the time. And may I say Thank that, you. May I say that, uh, that the best product you have for a small business, which I hope you take internationally, is the gold support. I think it's phenomenal. And without that, a small business can't operate. So I'm asking you, what do you do about that internationally? You might be referring to, to our pro support. Yeah, okay. yeah pro, pro support. And we have, we have something new called Pro Support Plus, even better <laughs> than Pro Support. <laughs> Cleverly named. <laughs> um, we have been actively uh, expanding the uh, global uh, footprint of our support. In fact, uh, this last year, we opened up support in a huge number of countries across Africa, you know, Southern Asia. Today, we actually covered 99% of the world's GDP with our support services. So I think we've already done that. There are a few countries where we're not allowed to operate, and we, we you know, can't, can't help you there. Um, but you know, it's, it's it's like it's you know the the three or four you you would think of. But um, you know, we are everywhere else, and that's a tremendously attractive. Uh, element, particularly for uh, companies that are globalizing. So they'll show up in, you know, Azerbaijan and Ivory Coast and uh, you know, anywhere else, and we're already there. Uh, you know, we, we started by following our customers around, yeah. and, it, and it started, you know, with, with the big global companies. Uh, but now you're seeing a lot of small and mid-sized companies that are, that are uh, globalizing much more rapidly. In the back on the aisle. My name is Chandrakan Pancholi from Overseas India Weekly, and I'm still using your desktop since 10 years. <laughs> but I'm Thank still you. I'm still very vague. You are very vague about your business model, and I'm trying to figure out what type of business model you are following now. And it has nothing to do with few drinks I had at the reception. <laughs> but are you following the crowd? Are you having the same thing like software business and security business and other things which other people are doing? So how do you differ? What is your return on equity as you are private now and whether you are going to become an IPO again? Well, I can tell you that, that the uh, return on equity for Dell, um, uh, going back to um, you know, the uh, late 80s, today forward, has averaged uh, you know, well over 30%. Uh, and, and we do have an attractive business model from a, from a capital and a cash conversion standpoint. Uh, you know, there's there's been a, been a pretty big change in the last four or five years as we focus more on uh, solutions. So we're definitely in the product business, but uh, you know, we, we see our growth opportunity as helping customers solve the bigger problems. Uh, you know, go, going beyond just products. And what we found as we created more and more powerful products is that just having the product wasn't sufficient. Uh, you needed to be able to help the customer apply the solution. Some customers wanted us to actually run it for them, and we needed combinations of hardware and software and services together to be able to uh, address the opportunity. 
and we hope we can replace your, your 10 year old desktop. <laughs> there have been a few advances in technology uh, that might interest you <laughs> recently. <laughs> right there. Hi, I'm Marshall Sonnenshine, Chairman of Sonnenshine Partners, and I'm on the faculty at Columbia. Uh, when we break, I'll give you the piece that I wrote called The Curious Case of Dell. It's published at Columbia Business School. It's now a case. Um, and it talks about some of the curiosities that I think bedeviled the company as a public company, which was a, a tough ride for a while, and that bedeviled the process of going private. But I'm wondering uh, what some of the curiosities are about American business from your perspective during uh, that long ride, about being public, about the nature of boards or activists or financial markets or competitiveness, any of the great themes that we think about when we reflect on American business in the world today must, um, I imagine, must strike you as including some curiosities. What are some of the things that you witnessed uh, over these past 20 years that, that maybe could change for the better if somehow one could flip a switch and change things? Well, uh, you know, look, we, we think there's an important role for the public markets, for sure. And uh, by the way, you know, in the 25 years that Dell was a public company, our shares appreciated 13,500 percent, which was 27 times better than the S&P 500. So if somebody had bought the shares at the time of the IPO and the shares were sold at the time of going private, that, that was a, quite an attractive return. And, um, you know, one observation I have during that 25 years certainly is more and more of the available time of the, of the board was spent on backward-looking activities as opposed to forward-looking activity. And this was a function of, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley and, and uh, uh, Dodd-Frank and, you know, all, all, all of those kinds of activities. Um, you know, I, 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 think, I think there are some new models that are being explored out there in terms of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, companies that, that go public but want to retain a longer term perspective. Um, you know, we're, we're perfectly happy being private, so, so uh, um, you know, I think it's it's that's a that's a big question you're asking. Um, uh, let me let me ask you a question about that public versus private. I mean, there are companies you point out that sort of manage to maintain that long-term perspective. Mm -hmm. Amazon, as an example, you know, Jeff Bezos has managed to convince the market that you know it doesn't matter what happens in the short run. That he's making these very smart investments. He has the track record demonstrated, and that over time it'll pay off. You couldn't have done the same thing as a public company. You sort of better articulated that vision and got, given your success, given what you delivered for shareholders over time, and gotten permission to make the kinds of investments that you felt you needed to. You know, I'm I'm an optimistic guy. So could could we have done it? Yeah, I think we could do it. I think it would be slower, right? So so you know, and and so uh, you know, uh, being private gives us the freedom and flexibility to do it in a, in, a, in, a, in a different way and accepting some of the volatility and the risk that goes with that. And um, you know, I think that's a, you know, in, in our case, uh, there, there, there was a pretty big uh, disconnect between yeah. the, the, the views of some of the more short-term minded investors uh, and what I think of as the, the long-term owner-operator perspective. Yes. Uh, Benjamin Barber. We've talked a lot about uh, business here, not so much about technology and not all, at all about the background environment of science in which as a technological entrepreneur you operate. I have a background question which really interests me as somebody who's been an innovator and a leader in business technology, you live in a country where a considerable preponderance of people don't believe in science. You know, they're creationists, they don't believe in the science of uh, climate warming. Uh, they really don't seem to know the difference between science and opinion. We had, a we had a president not so long ago who said science is just another form of opinion and you have a right to yours, I have a right to mine. I'm wondering how it is for you to do business in technology 
in a country which is probably in the developed world the most backward in the world in terms of its uh, popular understanding of science? Well, I'm not sure what your question is, but, <laughs> but you know, we, 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 we love doing business in America, you know, um, <laughs> and I think it's a great country. <laughs> Um, you know, w we do have ha about half our business out outside the United States. Um, you know, the 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 U.S. Uh, from a from a technological standpoint it, it is is quite advanced, uh, and you know, don't don't really see your question manifested it, it, manifesting itself as a problem from from you know our sort of business perspective. Sir. Um, Eric Miller from JP Morgan. I'm a tech banker. Uh, the first laptop I was given 20 years ago was a Dell, and the one that I got three months ago when I took this job was a Dell, so I've upgraded. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question for you, I guess somewhat along those lines, is really, you know, given your role as the global advocate for entrepreneurship, what are the things that you're going to advocate for, or, you're, or you are advocating for, from a U.S. perspective in terms of what you'd like to see in terms of policy and our regulations around technology? Yeah, my, my, my role with the UN is very, very focused. I, I really only have one job, and that is to convince world leaders that job creation and entrepreneurship should be one of the sustainable development goals that they vote on in September 2015. And you know, if you're in business or you're an entrepreneur or you're involved in creating businesses, this seems pretty obvious to you. Uh, but apparently not the case in, 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 with all world leaders. So, so my job is to convince them of that. You know, simple observation is if you look at the sustainable development goals, it's pretty hard to imagine those things happening without job creation. And where do the jobs come from? As I said earlier, 70 to 90% come from new and emerging businesses, entrepreneurial businesses. We need more of those. You know, you, you, you could argue, and I'm, 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 I'm more of a, uh, you know, I'm not waiting for the government to, to you know, help me conduct my, my business. Um, but look, government can, can make it a little bit easier or a little bit harder. And um, I think, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, I was in, I was in uh, France last week. We as Dell, uh, pay 70 different kinds of taxes in France. Pretty complicated, right? Just, just to calculate it, you know. Uh, and so, you know, if you want, you want more entrepreneurs, you want more new businesses, uh, you know, make it, make it easier. Uh, the, the big companies often have a, a voice. Um, the smaller companies, the entrepreneurs, often don't have a voice, but that's actually where the jobs are being created. Yes. Uh, Jason Tepperman uh, from Promontory Local Credit. A big part of competing in the systems business, uh, historically at least, has been being a low-cost producer, uh, managing inventory, working capital. And historically, I think a lot of industries have found that when they're a low-cost producer, it drives away some of the talent they need or, or the ambition that they need. Uh, do you see that as a tension in your business? And if you do, how do you, how do you manage that element of, uh, of your activity? You know, I think it's another kind of innovation. I mean, we have in our operations discipline, we have a, um, a, a, a process where every couple of years, we will hire a bunch of new graduates often from programs like the LFM program at MIT, and we'll give them a challenge uh, you know, fr from an operational perspective, whether it relates to inventory or cycle time or you know, process flows or w quality, whatever it might be, combinations of those things. And we don't actually know how to do it. Right? <laughs> we don't tell them that. Um, <laughs> but you know, they'll often get 80 or 90 percent of the way, maybe even you know exceed what what, and and they'll create a lot of new ways of doing things, and that's how you keep you know in, in improving. And you know if we don't do it, somebody else is going to, and uh, so you know that that's just another form of innovation as far as I'm concerned. 
we're in a world in which there's massive investment in startups. How do you as a big company attract sort of the top talent sort of without that sort of big equity opportunity that so many young people in particular are looking for? Yeah, it, it is a pretty amazing time right now in terms of uh, startups, and I think that's overall quite a healthy thing. You could argue whether it's too frothy or not, but, but uh, in aggregate, it, it's, a, it's a very good thing for the economy. We haven't really had a problem uh, attracting people to the company, and I'll say since we've gone private, the, the, the interest in joining the company has, has gone up you know, considerably because you know, people see it as, a, as a, another wave of the adventure and the growth. And uh, we are headquartered in Austin, Texas. A lot of people like to, like to come to Austin. Uh, hopefully they don't, they don't all come because we, 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 we can't have them all coming there, but, but you know, we're, we're, <laughs> we're operating all, all over the world and, and uh, uh, there, are, there are definitely uh, particular kinds of skills where, where there are shortages for, for our, our whole industry, but uh, we've, we've been able to attract and, and develop the, the talent we need for the most part. Do you think we are in a startup bubble right now? I think there there are some concerning uh, signs out there. You know, it, it, it's 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 always hard to you know call call these things uh, specifically. Um, you know, there the 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 level of 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 kind of digital disruption, reinvention uh, that's going on right now is very, very high. I think we're going to see more of that, not less of it. Um, uh, so that's, that's the offsetting piece of this. And, and, and what's interesting about many of those companies is their business model innovations. They're not really technical innovations. Um, and, those, and they're incredibly hard to predict you know, if you're trying to think about the technology. So you know we can think about what's going on in software or semiconductors uh, or m material science, but that won't lead you to understand eBay or Uber or Airbnb. So right. those are those are different kinds of co combinations of technology and business model. Yes. Leticia Garriott, uh, Escape Dynamics, a space technology company. Uh, Michael, as a, as a leading technology entrepreneur, what do you see your role in maybe helping companies like, uh, and not the companies themselves, but innovation in the US? We see Tesla, we see Uber that you mentioned running into big regulatory issues that often are linked to very outdated uh, regulation and context, uh, and they're each battling on their own and innovation in the country is completely stifled. And do we let them just fight on their own or do all technology entrepreneur like you, is there, do you have a role to play? Do you do anything about it? What can we do about it as a nation? I, th I think we have a role to play. You know, we, we've taken the approach of, of going to the government, to Washington, to explain what it is we're doing, what role our t industry plays in creating new jobs, and uh, you know, being a bit proactive, and and uh, you know, also with the belief that if we if we do nothing, you know, we're we're likely to get you know regulations that don't really contemplate our, our business or our industry, and uh, you know, that's that's worked reasonably well. There 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 are always going to be these these uh, uh, new businesses that pop up that that are. Uh, that are you know very disruptive and and uh, concerning for for in incumbents. Uh, I don't know that there's a, a real e easy problem to that, or, or, or the, 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 there's no easy solution to that. And and then you have the the states you know getting getting involved in a number of those. Um, you you know uh, regulation is a really bad way to slow down. Uh, Innovation, because you know the, the the innovation will just pop up in another country. That other country will will move ahead, and and uh, uh, but you know again, um, we have about half our business outside the United States, and comparatively speaking, the U.S. is quite an attractive place to do business 
you know, a, as compared with most places in, in, in the world. So, you know, for all the uh, problems and challenges and opportunities we have here, uh, I think it still ranks. And, and you know, if you look at uh, net investment flows, uh, you know, the U.S. is still attracting tremendous amounts of investment. A lot of our European customers are expanding aggressively here in, in the United States uh, because they see it as, a, as an attractive market. Yes, sir. Right there. Thanks, uh, Eric Shub. We've seen a bunch of high-profile hacking incidents recently, including Sony this week, I guess, and um, suggestions that there are national security issues associated with that. What should we as a country be doing about that? Um, You know, this this is this is a, a, a complex issue. You have uh, an enormous number of bad actors out there, and the number of them are, are uh, uh, increasing. We've identified about 1,100 different uh, specific groups. We have a business called SecureWorks that helps protect the largest banks and financial uh, companies, pharmaceutical companies, anybody with valuable IP and also helps respond when there are you know, uh, incidents that, that, that occur. Uh, this is kind of the, 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 the new form of uh, warfare. And, and you know, there's intellectual property theft, there's state-sponsored, there are organized crime groups, uh, there are you know, all kinds of activist groups. Um, you know, the, 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 there are things that the government can do, and, and the government has some, some groups that, you know, communicate with uh, those of us in the technology sector that are working on this problem. Uh, there are some limitations in, 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 in the regulations in terms of our ability to share information with the government. There's work going on to, to make that a bit easier. Um, and then, and then, you know, there's this, there's this societal issue which relates to privacy. If you want to be private, you're also anonymous. If you want to be anonymous, then we can't tell you where the bad guys are. So uh, uh, how private do you, do you want to be? Well, this is not for me to answer. It's for society to answer. And, and uh, you know, we, we deal with this in... in, uh, in in you know airports and other public venues where you know uh, there there's inspection and, and authentication, you know inside your company, I mean Dan, you wouldn't allow some somebody in your company to sort of roam around the network and take whatever information and do whatever they wanted, to, and you had no idea who they are, right? You you kind of want to know who the but you can do that because it's you know it's it's your company. And you know you, you can control the, the environment there. You probably see more and more of those kinds of things. But the problem is getting more challenging because you have this federation of different systems and different users, and uh, it, it requires a real uh, build out of, of capability. We have time for one more question uh, in the back. Hi, I'm Amy Wilkinson. I'm an author with Simon & Schuster, publishing an entrepreneurship book. On, so I'm curious your perspective on running a technology company in Texas versus Silicon Valley and the advantages regionally you know, for where you are located and can you do this anywhere? Could you do it in Ohio? Could you do it in Wyoming? Like, you know, how do you start a high growth business anywhere? You know, I just started in Texas because that's where I was, and, and uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we have a we have a great office in, in Silicon Valley that came mostly from acquiring a bunch of other companies. Uh, I see a lot of the Silicon Valley companies coming to Texas, and you know, if you look at the the economy in Texas relative to the whole country, it's done very well, and it, it is a great place to do business. They sound like Rick Perry. Uh, <laughs> Well, let's 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 get back here on topic. <laughs> so, look, I, I think I think if you if you if you want to find a great company, first 
you'll find a, a great university. And, and in fact, I would tell you that there's no uh, great company where there's not a great university nearby. And it takes a long time to build great universities, you know, maybe a hundred years, right? You know, they, these things don't pop up in a decade. And uh, there are a lot of great universities out there. You know, we see startups you know, all over the, the country, all, all over the world. There definitely are these beehives of activity and incubators and uh, pools of talent. Uh, you know, our, our company, as it grew, um, recruited a lot of talent that came to Austin you know, to, to, help, to help the business grow. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly it, it, it's, it's not going to all be in, in one place. Um, but, you know, for us, Texas has, has been great. That's where I was born. And, and, uh, but we, we have, you know, 96% of the people we want to sell to don't live in America. And, and so, you know, we're, we're, we're out there expanding all over the world. That's, 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 that's where we see our, our market. Well, I think that's about all the time we have. I want to thank Michael Dell for his candor. Thank you. I'd, uh, I'd like to highlight that our next CEO speaker series uh, with DuPont's Ellen Coleman will be on December 18th. And thank you very much for joining us this evening.